The world has its eminent ones, but heaven holds the preeminent one. The world is distracted by greatness. Who could argue that Muhammad Ali was the greatest fighter of all time? <laughs> Uh, who could argue that Wayne Gretzky was the greatest hockey player of all times? You may not agree, but 33 is a pretty distinguished number. And of course, we'd love to claim that uh, Serena Williams uh, was the greatest of all time tennis player. But alas, she had her, uh, she had her pedestal challenged by a 19-year-old Canadian girl. Can you imagine? <laughs> Do you remember King Louis XIV of France? Preferred to be known as Louis the Great. He died in 1717, having left strict instructions on how his funeral was be to be conducted. He reserved the great cathedral of Notre Dame, where his ornate casket would lie in state, plated in gold, with one lone candle burning in the cathedral, all other candles being extinguished to highlight his presence and the reason that they were there. And of course, he'd left instructions that one of the court preachers would conduct the funeral oration. As Massillon ascended the stairs. He acted as though something was not right, so he quietly descended the stairs of that high pulpit and walked over to the candle on the casket and snuffed it out and then spoke in French twice. Only God is great. Only God is great. So of all the greatest claims that have ever been made on planet Earth, Jesus Christ makes the greatest claim of all. In fact, his claim landed him on a wooden cross. I can prove his claim to you from Hebrews chapter 1. Will you join me please for the reading of God's Word as we examine the unique claim of who Jesus Christ is in Hebrews chapter 1. We're beginning our chapter by chapter study of the book of Hebrews today. And I'm taking a fairly large chunk to read to you, but I'll try to cover as much of it as I can without being insensitive to time. But as always, I want to remind you that the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it, because this is the Word of the Lord. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke. He spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken again to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir or the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Speaking of Jesus, the writer says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Watch this now. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and you shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn, that is Jesus, that word there means the chief one, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Think Matthew chapter 2 or Luke chapter 2. In the arrival of Christ, in that ancient village of Bethlehem, the angels worshiped him. Verse 7, of the angels, he says, concerning the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. 
speaking to Jesus. They will perish. The earth will pass away, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will never end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they, that is angels, not all ministering or serving spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So let me just show you what I think this text is teaching us. Number one, God talks to those who will listen to him. Isn't that clear in verse number one? In many different ways, in various times in human history, God has spoken His Word, His truth, His light to the world. So it means that we have a God who speaks. The question is, are you listening? By the way, I think that when God talks to those who listen, those who listen are His people. Because Jesus was famous for saying in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So Jesus likens his sheep who inherit salvation as those who have heard his call. What was his call? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from your sin. Rest from your wandering off on paths of your own. But God speaks This is not a new concept, of course, in the New Testament, because you'll remember that great invitation in Psalm 95, where we are invited to worship and we are told, He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And then He says, today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. The writer of the book of Hebrews takes that theme and repeats it three times in the book of Hebrews. God is speaking. Make sure that you don't have a hard heart so that you can't hear what he is saying to us. Dallas Willard has become one of my best friends. We don't share much FaceTime because he's now in heaven. But I love his books, I love his teaching, and one of the things that he says about God's uh, presence in the early chapters of the Bible is that God must be a very chatty God. God seems to like to talk. He asks lots of questions of the people that he made because his goal is he's trying to build a friendship with us. He's trying to make a relationship with us. And of course, a mystic, which is what I would say I am. A mystic is someone who believes that when God, when we speak to God, God speaks back to us. A quick word of warning. I don't want you to think that I've gone off my nut, that I've lost my theological marbles, but I'm telling you that by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, we live by the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit, and we are to pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? I have some capacity to hear from God and to know that He is leading me in my life. There are all kinds of great, great dangers. And I don't pay a great deal of attention to the people who walk around the countryside claiming that God said so and so to them. I don't, I, I'm careful. You need to be careful when you say... God's speaking to my heart. I think the number one evidence of God speaking to our hearts is that there will be a transformation of our character, who we are as people. Our ethics are transforming regularly because we're hearing from the Lord. He's making us into a people who are like Jesus. So this text opens with the bold claim that God is speaking. Are you listening to him? The second thing the text says right away in verse number two is that Jesus is the word by which God speaks to us. Beginning at verse two all the way down to verse number 13, he gives what I consider to be one of the most awe-inspiring pictures of Jesus in all the Bible. And he says, if you want to hear from God, uh, take notice of the life of Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself. Doesn't Hebrews chapter 1 sound like John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse number 14. And the Word became flesh. 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when God wanted to send his strongest message, and by the way, it is the fulfilling message of the Old Testament. When God spoke in the Old Testament, it was only to partially reveal his ultimate plan. When he spoke in Jesus, he put an exclamation mark afterwards and said, this is what I was speaking all along. This is why I was speaking all along. So would you take just a few minutes? I don't have time in the message this morning to examine everything that is said about Jesus, but I want to take a moment and show you some of my favorites in the passage. What it says about Jesus as the word of God spoken to us. In verse number two, we learn that he is the beginning and the end. Were you watching the reading of God's word? You should have been thinking about Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews now says that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world and the universe. He's the beginning, this text says. The world was created by him. He was present and participatory in the creation of the world. But verse number two also tells us that he is the heir of all things. That means everything will culminate in him. Everything will finish in him, conclude in him. The work of God's salvation will be finally delivered to the Father. Jesus will lift up the church, his bride, and say, I present to you the glorious bride without spot or wrinkle. But he will also bring all wickedness, all injustice, and all sin to the Father's feet and say, I have defeated it once and for all. And Satan at that moment will be thrown into the bottomless pit, according to the book of the Revelation. So Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Notice in verse number three, he is the radiant portrait of the glory of God. The literal interpretation of that verse could read, he is the shining glory and the exact expression of God himself. Because he's claiming, of course, that he is God. That's why he's superior to the angels. You know why that's important, don't you? Because Moses once famously prayed in Exodus chapter 33, show me your glory, Lord. Pull back the veil that hides you from me and let me see the majesty that shines in your presence. And now when we say to God with the same kind of spiritual hunger, I want to see your glory, Lord. He says, look at the cross. Look at Jesus. Study the life of Christ. If you want to peer into the face of God, you look into the eyes of Jesus Christ. And you have seen the glory of God. Because Jesus said, I've come to reveal the Father in all of his greatness. Seeing Jesus is like standing before a living portrait of God's very presence, painted in the dynamic colors of his glory that radiates from his throne in heaven. And so this text says that as the shining glory of God and the exact expression of himself, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. (laughs) That means not only, not only was Jesus present and participatory in the creation of the planet and the universe, this text says that nothing in all the vast universe, known and unknown to man, are held together without Jesus as the center that glues it all together. You hear what I'm saying, church family? Jesus is mighty in that he is the exact representation of God himself. He's the one who created the world, and he has the power to keep it all together. And the text says, when he sat down at God's right hand, he finished the work and lives to intercede for us. So when you read the words of Hebrews chapter 1 about the shining radiance of Christ and the exact expression of God himself, you can't help but think about that famous benediction that Moses told Aaron to bestow upon the people of Israel. Do you remember what it says? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Every Jew 
that knew that famous benediction would know exactly what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, that in Jesus, God was lifting up his countenance upon us. He was shining his face upon us in approval and blessing. Still with me, church family? I've lost a couple of people, but I can understand it's early in the day. He is, he is Alpha and Omega. He is the radiant portrait of the glory of God. In verse three, we're told he's the one great sacrifice who purifies us from our sin. Again, every Hebrew that read that verse would know what it was talking about. Because once a year, according to Leviticus chapter 23, the high priest on the day of atonement would take a spotless lamb, slit its throat, drain the blood, go into the inner sanctuary where dwelt the mercy seat of God, and he would sprinkle the blood as a remembrance, as an offering to God, as a preview of the one great sacrifice who would be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Oh, there's so much more in this passage, but I'm going to just take a moment to show you a couple more, maybe a few more. The text says in verses 8 and 9 that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're told that he is a kingdom of righteousness, he hates wickedness, and he rules in his right hand is a scepter of righteousness. So it means that Jesus Christ is the Lord over God's kingdom. What does that mean? It means that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and wherever he is, he rules. He's able to put down all rebellion, and he's able to bring glory to the Father. It means that Jesus is in charge, people. It means that the head of the body of Christ is the one who commands all things. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Father has given him a great kingdom. And you remember he said to us in that text that Brad introduced us to a few moments ago in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth belong to me, and I'm commissioning you. The average Christian does not know how much authority they have in the spiritual realm and in spiritual, the spiritual kingdom of God. Because we are to move in step with Jesus, we are to take our stand in his kingdom through the power of the gospel, and we are to advance in the work of Christ in the authority of Christ. Practically what it means is, most of my life I've preached to audiences that were receptive and um, believed the Bible. But I've had many experiences where I've preached where they just as soon booted me to the door, uh, where they were not receptive and they were not hearing the word of God. In those cases, I want you to know that I was faithful to the people who enjoyed the Word of God and those who hated the Word of God because my authority does not come from me. It is Christ's authority. It is His power that enables His church to go downtown Toronto and hand out leaflets of the gospel to share with people the hope of Christ. It's being obedient under the authority of Christ. He's the King of Righteousness. That we're told also in verse number nine that the Father has anointed him. When you hear that word, you should, of course, think about the messianic application or, or parallel that it has. Because the word Christ, which is the Hebrew word or the Greek word for the Messiah, uh, simply means the anointed one. He is the anointed one. God anointed him. Uh, Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. But did you notice what oil was used in the anointing of Jesus? I just think this is so cool. He is anointed with the oil of gladness. It means that this one who is king of kings, who has his own kingdom and possesses all authority, rules with a benevolent heart, a kind heart, a heart that is filled with joy. He's been anointed with the oil of gladness. So how do you know that you have teamed up with Jesus? He's putting some of his joy in your heart. It's a joy to follow Jesus. It's a joy to know Jesus. It's a joy to serve Jesus. And yet, some of the most miserable people I know are, are Christians. And they have forgotten that Jesus was anointed by the Father with the oil of gladness. The women were privileged to host Lynn Cullum yesterday from the Open Door Mission, 
and uh, they were teaming up with Lynn and gathering of uh, feminine hygiene products for the cupboards at the open door. And Lynn told the, lady, the ladies a story of the cupboards being quite bare during the summer, but they were recently stocked. And a young single mother with a five-year-old daughter uh, came to, to the open door mission, and they haven't had enough food at home to eat. And here stands this single mother and this young five-year-old girl. And Lynn opens the cupboards that are now full. And the little girl begins to leap and dance and sing. And say, Mommy, Mommy, look at all the food! I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if God would anoint some of our hearts with some dancing and leaping and celebrating rather than being the sourpusses that we are? Forgive me, got off tangent. Hopefully that came from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Ask God to anoint you with the oil of gladness, to fill your heart with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, and peace. Joy! <laughs> How do you know you're filled with the Spirit? Starts with love, moves quickly to joy, and it overflows with peace. And there are seven of the qualities. Let me just wrap it up there because there are so many more things I want to say about Christ, but you can dive into the chapter. Let me just remind you what I'm trying to tell you from the text. God speaks to those who listen to him. And his language, the word of God is Jesus. And uh, number three, I want you to see in the text that angels are servants of God in his work in the kingdom. Angels are God's servants in the work of God's kingdom. Angels are pretty prominent in the text. Don't you see that? There are eight references to them in verses 4 through 14. They are used as a comparison to show how Christ is so far superior to them, but they are highlighted as participants in the work of God. So this text makes it very clear. They are messengers. Angels take God's word and announce it at his command. <laughs> what a great example they are to us. They do it obediently. We, most times, reluctantly do what God asks us to do. Angels do it immediately. And of course, they're referred to in verse number six as announcing the coming of Christ and celebrating that he arrived. They're viewed in verse number six as messengers. If you want to learn how to worship, study the practice of the angels in heaven who are always in a state of praising God and giving Him glory, and their hearts are humble before Him and fully engaged. They're also called, isn't this intriguing? They're called servants of God. They're wind and flames of fire, but they are at God's beck and call, especially for you. Especially to work on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. I wonder how that works. I don't know. I know some people who say they've seen angels. I never have, at least not that I know about. But I wonder if it works just in a practical way because when I was a raucous teenager, getting myself into deep water and often putting my life at risk because of my stupidity, I wonder if angels were dispatched the night that we were barreling down an old country road in a beat up jalopy and we were high as a kite and we hit a, a hole so big that it literally ripped parts of the car. Uh, away, including the gas tank. I wonder if God dispatched his angels and said, keep that stupid boy alive. <laughs> I don't know. This text makes it clear. Angels are servants for your sake, for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. They're cooperating with God. I'd love to say more about these wonderful angels. But I want to ask, do you have the heart of a servant? Fourthly and lastly, I can't help but show you, God speaks through his son, and angels are his servants for those who are the heirs of God's salvation. Because that's what we're called in this text. The heirs of God's salvation. These words are reminiscent of what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, that you are born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that can never fade or pass away. 
Jesus Christ paid the penalty of my sin at the cross, and now I stand to inherit the greatest existence known to mankind. So get, God waits for you, longs for you, calls you to inherit salvation by listening to his message bound up in the life of Jesus and take his free gift and become his faithful servant. Father, thank you for this beautiful word in Hebrews chapter 1 about the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and God and Lord, and for the work of your spirit to exalt him. Draw your people to him, I pray in his name. Amen.